Good morning, everyone. Have you ever felt like when you were singing that you're going to throw off the song leader? Because I do. I was sitting there. I am having no clue where I'm at. I can't follow Scott. And I'm sitting here thinking he is incredibly talented to hear my off pitch, completely wrong, singing, no clue, and still staying on. And I thought, that is pure skill. Thank you, Scott. You always do such a great job of leading us in worship. I walked out of the country western store with a pair of black cowboy boots with stitching on the sides. I also had a beautiful straw hat that was shaped to my head and I was so proud of myself as I presented myself to the family when I was in Texas and I felt like that moment I looked like a real cowboy. The problem was I was missing the number one element of being a cowboy. You would think it would be cows, cattle, maybe a ranch, maybe a tractor. But I was so Canadian that I was not even aware that I was missing the most crucial element of every real cowboy from Texas. I had no belt buckle. <laughs> and we all know the measure of a true cowboy is the size <laughs> of the gold plated belt buckle on their pants. But I wasn't aware of the belt buckle. I didn't know any better because I was a Canadian from Nova Scotia. All real Texans know if you're going to get the cowboy boots and the cowboy hat, you've got to have the buckle as well to go for the real look. I did not realize how out of place I looked. I may have wanted to look like a cowboy, desired to look like a Texan, but I was still just a Canadian from Canada. When it comes to our walk with Christ, as we continue our series on wild transformation, sometimes we do not realize that we are looking like the world or we are looking so different from the world that we are no longer effective in the world. That good Christianity comes into culture to influence culture and we influence it in positive ways. But what happens in our walk with Christ that we think we are looking different, that we think we are the light of the world, but we have become so enculturated that means that we have so become part of culture that we don't even see that we're looking more Western than we are Christian. That we are looking so much like society that we don't think that we are looking more American then we are looking Christian. It's almost like the person who just assumes that they are Christian. And so they reason in their mind, I am a Christian. What I do is Christian. Therefore, what I do is being like a Christian. But they become more just like everybody else. They don't stand out for Christ. They think they are. They think that they're really living a godly life, but they have become so accustomed to culture that they look more cultural than they do converted. The struggle for the church today is finding the balance between looking so peculiar, so different from the world that we no longer connect to the world because the world kind of has
just moved on. They don't think that the church is relevant any longer, so they don't come to the church or Christian people because they don't believe the church has any answers for them in this century. And then sometimes churches become so adapted to culture that you have the church of what's happening now and they have lost their sense of uniqueness. And so people do two things when it comes to church. It's so old, it's not relevant. Or it's so trendy, why bother? As Christians today, we need to hold fast to the middle ground. We have to connect to our culture, but we have to keep our Christianity first. Look what it says in John chapter 15, verse 19. If you are of the world, the world would love you as its own, but because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Jesus is 100% predictive in this. If we are so different from the world, the world is going to hate us. The world is going to hate us even when we do the right thing. But we can't just be above culture. And it's fascinating sometimes in the church, we almost think that we can pick and choose how we are involved in culture, that somehow we transcend this world as Christians in the sense that culture doesn't influence us at all, that we, everything we do in the church is completely from God and that there is no cultural trappings that we have in our Christian walk. But that's just not true. The most dangerous thing that can happen to a Christian is when they think that culture does not influence them. And typically when they think that, culture is influencing them the most. They're not aware of how culture is affecting them. Look at what it says in Matthew chapter 5, verse 14. You are the light of the world. And 1 Corinthians 5, 10. For then you would have to go out of the world, Paul says. And then in Titus 2, 14, you are a peculiar people, a particular people. You look at all these verses here. And there's a balancing here. As Christians, we are the light of the world. We have to be transformed. We have to be different. We have to be godly in a godless society. But it's not that we can just choose to separate ourselves from the world. We can't sit back and say, oh, I'm not going to have any interaction with the world. Nobody has ever gone to somebody who's driving a buggy wearing denim for some help with peer pressure. People sit back. If you are a young girl or boy, you're not going to go to somebody that you consider to be completely out of touch with reality in the struggles that people are facing today. And so we can't just remove ourselves from culture. We have to engage in culture. But when we do that, we are going to stand out. Because we have Christian convictions and values. It's fascinating when you look at the history of the church. You have a picture here of David Lipscomb. And he wrote this book called Civil Government. And his whole methodology of dealing with culture was just forget it. He wrote that a Christian should not even vote. We have election season. I think it's perfectly fine for you to vote. Go vote. He also advocated pacifism. That means that Christians, if they were to fight in the army in America, would be sinning. 
His solution to culture was just avoid it. Well, it's really not that easy. You can make a decision. Do you want to avoid culture? Or do we want to be intentional about how our lights are seen in culture? Jesus was sensitive to culture. He wasn't like the fish that did not realize he was in water. He was enculturated. Think about Jesus. He was a first century Jew. He operated and talked about things that people could connect with. So when he gave a conversation, when he taught, he talked about sheep. He talked about sand. And in that society, they understood that. That connected with them. Now imagine if Jesus came to the first century and he says, I want to talk to you about how someday people are going to use Facebook inappropriately. <laughs> or he said, as he pulled out his iPhone and said, let me check the weather to see if we should go across the Sea of Galilee. He didn't do that. He said, sheep, sand. How many of you in this room, if I was to give you a whole lesson on tending sheep, even owned a sheep? Raise your hand if you have even owned a sheep. Yeah, we got like two. How many of you have an iPhone? That connects sheep we don't have a clue about. Now imagine Jesus. He said, verily, verily. In the Greek, it's different. That's in English. But he would say that over and over again. Imagine if Jesus looked at his audience and said, dudes, this is some groovy teaching. They would not pay attention because he was not connecting to his culture. He was not speaking in a way that his culture could hear him. As Christians, we can't avoid culture. We have to learn how to influence it. And so we are transformed into the image of Jesus. Not so that we stand out so far that culture no longer pays attention. But we stand and look like Jesus so we can fulfill the command to be the light in the world. The typical two responses that you see as Christians deal with culture is over-adaptation or under-adaptation. It's interesting, with over-adaptation, what happens is the church becomes so much like the world that the world doesn't even recognize the unique nature of Christianity. That it tries to become so cool and so relevant that it loses its leavening effect. It's, look, if you hear in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 to 2, and this is the man who is in sin, and the church is not dealing with this behavior. Even in this context, Paul will advocate to him. He says, why are you allowing this man to be in this adulterous relationship and commit this fornication? Even the world doesn't allow this. The church was allowing sin in their church and not realizing that their reaction maybe they thought it was loving or kind or tolerance but it wasn't of God look what it says here it is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you and of kind that is not tolerated even among the pagans for a man has his father's wife and you are arrogant Ought you not to rather to mourn 
Let him who has done this be removed from among you. The church here over adapted to culture to such an extreme that even the culture says this was wrong. But then look at Matthew chapter 23 verses 1 to 4. This is how we need to process our decisions in the church when it comes to culture. Sometimes we become so opposed to culture that we just fight everything. We, we will come up with rules in our heads and say, well, you know, this is of God. You must wear a tie at church because Jesus wore a tie. And, and if we're going to be faithful, this is what you must look like. This is how you must behave. And we start to infuse cultural commands on Christianity. So under adaptation is where the culture is changing and it leaves the church behind. Have you ever walked into a church building and felt like you got into a time warp to the 1950s? Have you ever been around Christian people that they are so out of touch with what is happening in this world that you sit back and think, do you even have internet? We don't respect that. And that is not a sign of godliness that you have so removed yourself from culture that you're no longer a light in culture. So under adaptation turns into legalism. You start making all of these rules to protect yourself from culture. You start to be transformed, but not by Christ, but being reactionary to the culture around you. You're making rules up. This is why Jesus says this to them in Matthew 23, verses 1 to 4. Notice the principle here. Then Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, and the scribes and the Pharisees sit on Moses' seat. So practice and observe whatever they tell you, but not what they do, for they preach, but do not practice. They tie up heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to move them with their fingers the Pharisees and the scribes will make these rules, place them on others. But they're not practicing this. They're making up laws where God did not make them. The principle that we need to live by is this. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 to 2. It needs to be the spirit of we are not making rules to fight culture. We are trying to be like Jesus. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Notice what takes place here. We as Christians a lot of times look at and say, yes. We don't need to be conformed to this world. We need to be transformed by the renewing of the teachings of Christ. But notice at the second part of this verse, what do we need to be doing? We need to be looking at, is this of God or is this just culture? We need to test if this is something a Christian can do or is this sin? Matthew chapter 21, verse 24 to 26. Jesus answered them, I also will ask you one question. And if you tell me the answer, then I also will tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John. From where did it come? From heaven or from man? And they discussed it among themselves, saying, If we say from heaven, he will say to us, Why did you not believe him? But if we say from man, we are afraid of the crowd, for they all hold that John was a prophet. When culture changes, 
And when society changes, we have to ask ourselves, is this of God or is this of man? Is this sinful or is this neutral? Is this wrong in and of itself or is this just a cultural practice? And too often we do two things. We reject it and then we lose connection to culture or we adapt to it. And the next thing we know, we are in sin and we don't even see it. Paul had the principle here, 1 Corinthians 9.20. To the Jews I became as a Jew in order to win Jews. To those under the law I became as one under the law. Though not being myself under the law, that I might win those under the law. This is the principle I'm trying to communicate. We, in our wild transformation, have to transform. Not that we become so disconnected to the world around us, but we become more connected to Christ, which allows us to show the light to the world around us. Reminds me of this. Of the lady who walks up to the teenage girl. She sees the teenage girl. And she walks up to her and she goes, I can't believe you would wear that to church. You are showing way too much skin. And the teenage girl looks at her, and this has never happened. But the teenage girl could look at that same lady who's wearing a $500 outfit and a $50,000 ring with $20,000 extra dollars of jewelry on her and judge her right back. Why? Look at 1 Timothy 2.9. Likewise also that women should adorn themselves in respectful apparel with modesty and self-control, not with braided hair and gold, or pearls or costly attire. Sometimes we will judge one issue and totally forget another issue. Both issues are culturally judged. But we think one is always automatically wrong and the other one we don't see. Why is that? It's because of hockey fights. <laughs> I was a minister in a small town in Waynesboro, Tennessee, about 2,000 people. And I was there for four and a half years. And I remember one day I was doing something and Charity just looked at me. She goes, Matthew, for a Canadian, you became the best redneck I've ever seen. And I said, what do you mean by that? She goes, you love Tennessee football. You love barbecue. I never got into hunting. But I connected to those people. They saw me as one of them. Until the hockey fight. I planned a hockey oding where I would take all these Southerners from the small town to watch their very first hockey game. They were all excited. We had maybe 25, maybe we had 35. It was a big deal for them. They never saw a hockey game. And they had this Canadian minister and they thought, what is this odd sport? So we showed up, we get our seats and we all sit down. And I think, in one of the periods, maybe it's in the second period, all of a sudden there's this hockey fight that breaks up. And I jump up and I yell, nobody wins until there's blood. <laughs> and they all looked at me, these judgmental Christians. And they could not believe that their minister wants to see blood. 
one of the teenage girls that has now grown up as an adult, she shared with me that story about how her parents went to that game. And on the way home, they discussed how a minister should not want fighting. And they could not believe that I would endorse such a terrible thing. A minister of all people. They became big hockey fans. And she told me, she goes, now my family jumps up and yells at a hockey fight. There's no blood, there's no winner. They were judging my Canadianness. Because Canadians, we like hockey fighting. We don't think it's wrong. But when you're in a southern town and you get in a fight, that seems wrong. Sometimes as Christians, we find ourselves judging, maybe even the world, and one another over culture and not transformation. Or we find ourselves becoming so much like the world that we don't realize we're losing our light in this world. True transformation connects with the world so that the world can connect to Christ. That's real transformation of being in the world, but not of the world. You have an opportunity to ponder that. Maybe you want to make that decision and be that light to the world, but it starts with you becoming a Christian. If you will believe, confess, repent, and be baptized for mission of sins, rise over that water to newness of life. But your mission is not to remove yourself from the world to such an extent that you're no longer an influence, but allows you to be like Christ in the world and make a difference for good. Why don't you ponder that as we stand at the same the invitation song?